Good afternoon, Vina Singla with the Natural Resources Defense Council speaking in support of item 25 of the Biomonitoring California program. Biomonitoring California tracks toxic substances like industrial chemicals and pollution in the environment and in people. And um, as such is a very um, critical tool for the state to ensure that uh, all Californians have a safe and healthy environment um, free from dangerous levels of toxic substances. And this is particularly important for environmental justice communities that have been most impacted by environmental uh, uh, industrial chemicals and pollution. And um, I appreciate the comments of the uh, previous witness speaking about the need for prevention and um, its importance um, for public health and community health. And I think the um, um, importance of biomonitoring for um, public health and communities is evident in the broad support for this proposal um, from the medical, environmental, and, um, and community organizations. And to, to name just a few in support, the American Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network, Black Women for Wellness, Breast Cancer Fund, California Environmental Justice Alliance, Comité Civico del Valle, Communication Workers of America, District 9. So really um, broad support from the medical, environmental, and, and public health communities speaking to the importance of uh, the biomonitoring program to ensure a safe and healthy environment for all Californians. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Eduardo Martinez with the California Medical Association uh, here to support a couple items uh, to improve access to care. Uh, obviously, we want to associate ourselves with prior comments made about uh, items number 9 and 10, the AB 97 cuts and Medi-Cal provider rates, obviously, we feel like are too low. Um, also want to support item 13 to make sure folks have access to necessary reproductive drugs. Um, but really wanted to spend the bulk of our time talking about um, item number 36 um, relative to the primary care uh, workforce uh, programs under the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. Um, we are asking for a $100 million one-time augmentation uh, to fund primarily the Song Brown program. Um, Senator Monning, you're familiar with, and Senator Stone, you were getting to this question about we, the need to address our primary care shortage, um, and not only just from a overall statewide perspective, but particularly pockets of areas, uh, perhaps uh, both of your districts are, you know, full well, uh, pockets of uh, primary care shortage areas. This program is uniquely designed to do that, right? So what we're asking for is uh, $82.5 million to be infused into the Song Brown program, uh, whose, whose ongoing mission is to fund uh, training programs in underserved areas with long, um, long uh, history of placing residents in underserved areas. What we know from the data that's borne out is residents are highly likely to remain in states and in areas where they train. It makes a lot of sense. They get older, they plant roots, they start earning a little income, and they settle into those areas. And this is how we're going to address uh, some of these uh, access to care issues that we've talked about here. Uh, we're working with a really great coalition this year, the primary, California Primary Care Association, CMA, of course, the California Hospital Association, the Osteopathic Physicians and Surgeons of California, Planned Parenthood, the American College of Physicians, and the California Children's Hospital Association as well. So I uh, really appreciate your uh, favorable consideration of that at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Jody Hicks representing the California Academy of Family Physicians. Also want to associate previous comments and support for item number three, seven, nine, and 10, all dealing with um, Medi-Cal and, and access to care, and have always uh, supported um, any kind of solution for access to care, including things dealing with Medi-Cal coverage, so happy to support those today. We are also one of the stakeholders for item number 36, so I wanna uh, focus most of my comments on that. Um, just a, a couple of more facts to know about that program. When we we have more, right now currently we have more medical students than we have residency slots for them. So while we have been supportive and appreciate the legislature's investment in new medical schools, we're now graduating and investing in students and then some of them are having to go out of state to do their residency training programs. And as uh, my colleague Eduardo mentioned, there's a 70% chance that they'll stay there. So when we ship them out of state to start training, most of them do not come back to California. So 
it's a waste in our investment. And to the particulars of what we're asking for, it's 82.5 million, but want to note that Song Brown this year is losing upwards of $40 million in grants funding. So there's two federal grants that, that uh, were pilot programs due to ACA and those are ending. And then there's a California endowment grant that, that will not be renewed. So we'll be losing this year. Um, we come to the legislature every year hoping to expand Song Brown, but this year we're actually in danger of, of losing um, many, many slots. And so the first part of it, the 42, is just to keep it whole. And then we do want this year, especially because of the expansion of Medi-Cal, which we support, um, we really want to address primary care this year. And we know for the additional $40 million, the way Song Ground works is they give, based on how much they have in their fund, they give capitated amounts, grant monies to the programs that apply for them. So right now it's about $17,000, keeping in mind that a residency slot costs about $150,000. So while the grant money is great and helps keep those uh, open, it's not enough for incentivizing people to expand the program and open up additional slots. So that funding, and, and Oshped, or Sun Brown has the ability to give out more. So they could incentivize their program by giving out a higher grant. They can also give out money to open brand new programs. And we know at least four, actually one in Santa Cruz, that wants to open a brand new program that doesn't already have one. So th that money, which is a large amount of money, could also be used for that. So uh, we're hoping that that additional fund can be used creatively in a program that we know works and prioritizes underserved areas and spend that money to really uh, take care of the access problem here in California. Thank you. Uh, Chair and members, Sean South on behalf of the California Help Plus Advocates representing California's community clinics and health centers. Um, I'll open with a few of them. Obviously we support Health for All. We also support, so support the end of the a state recovery, it's a problem for our members in, in getting folks signed up for Medi-Cal, it's a concern for them, it should not be a barrier. We also support the restoration of, of the uh, full restoration of adult dental, in addition the, um, the other dental related pr provisions as well. We also support the school-based health funding as well and also um, strongly support the End of Life Options Act uh, phone line which will allow folks at their toughest time uh, to get the support that they need. Um, to the core of my contacts, uh, along with my colleagues, strongly support item number 36 on your agenda. Uh, this legislature uh, tries to deal with how do we get providers to serve underserved communities? How do we get providers to stay in underserved communities? Well, the best way that we found is to create the teaching health center, which is where physicians uh, come into our health centers. They do their full residencies within our health centers. They get an appreciation for our patients. They get appreciation for what they do. So not only are they serving the underserved community while residents, they also are much more likely to stay within our facilities going forward. So there's part of the budget request is money uh, both to make whole the current health centers that have about 100 residents currently, but also expand that uh, to different parts of the state. Because as Jody said, we're educating them putting them through medical school and then they're going to Arizona and New Mexico and beyond, they don't come back and we're really losing out on the opportunity. Uh, we also want to additionally thank uh, CMSP for their proposal. Any additional funds in the state loan, re loan re repayment program is vital for us. We compete with a lot of providers in the marketplace. This is one thing that we're able to offer um, our providers in order to get them to come and stay working in a community clinic or health center. It's difficult, it's an ongoing struggle, so we appreciate that additional funding for that as well. Thank you. Thank you, next please. My name is Gail Bowen, and I'm a Planned Parenthood employee, and I'm an, also an adolescent family life um, case manager, so I wanna speak with to number 21, please. Um, I wanna speak on behalf of teens that sometimes don't have a voice, um, sometimes they don't have a parent. Sometimes they don't have a place to live. And they certainly aren't in school most of the times that we get a referral. So the Adolescent Family Life Program is designed to empower and lift them up, get them in school, get them jobs, find the place to live, and try to get those, place, those things in place before they have children. So not only is it the adolescent that we're trying to 
lift up, we're also trying to lift up the child. And I also think that part of the reduction in the teen pregnancy rate is because of these case management programs that exist not only through our agency, but through the health department and other agencies that are funded to do this same work that we do. Um, so yes, the teen pregnancy rate is going down, but the highest risk teens are still in existence. They're still kicked out of their homes. They're still homeless. They're still not in school. And, and this is an essential program. I, I can't even, after 18 years of working with it, imagine it not existing. So I just wanted to advocate for them uh, because they need this program. And I would think they will continue to need it as long as there's pregnant and teens in. And also we work with the fathers and there's just a, there's so many dynamics to the AFLP program uh, that seem to be invisible, but we work with the parents, uh, the families, and, uh, the, and the new babies. So thank you for. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to acknowledge receipt of several hundred postcards in support of Adolescent Family Life Program. They came in into my office, and I'm sure the members got him as well. That's a beautiful thing. Thank you very much. Next witness, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Karen Ling here with Shayer Antwi on um, behalf of two separate items. Um, number 28 related to the TB challenge. Um, San Joaquin County, my client, has the sixth highest rate of tuberculosis in the state, and they would uh, strongly encourage you to consider uh, fighting for that money uh, as it gets closer to the end of the budget session. And secondly, on uh, Part B, number 37 related to CMSP, wanted to thank your staff for putting it on the agenda today. CMSP is blazing trail when it comes to expanding coverage in new places in the wake of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, they really appreciate uh, the OSHPED feedback that they've received so far, and hopefully for the Department of Finance, music to your ears, no general fund money. They want to spend their own. They just need the uh, language to change in the statute to authorize OSHPED to take our money. So, And we're happy to give it to them. So with those, uh, with those comments, I thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Betsy Armstrong on behalf of the County Health Executives Association. I'm here today to urge your support for items 27 and 28. That's the lab aspire and the t tuberculosis control proposal um, submitted by our health officer colleagues. Um, both address core uh, local health department functions and we believe are, vitally, are, are vital investments um, to protect our communities at the local level. We also wanted to just note our support and concept for um, item number 29 that proposes to establish uh, the Community Health and Improvement Fund um, and certainly agree that there is a need for a stable and flexible funding source at the local level to address chronic disease prevention. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, Carl London here on behalf of the California Physical Therapy Association. Uh, I do want to thank Senator Stone for raising item number 16. This is designed to correct a very inadvertent error in trailer bill language drafting that was done previously. Uh, EMG studies, it's a very specific study that uh, very few physical therapists in the state perform. 20 are certified by the state licensing board. Only 28 are capable of doing KEMG, which relates to muscles. It's a study that's used to determine whether or not a patient uh, has nerve damage, where the location of the nerve damage is, and then that becomes part of the evaluation that a physician uses in order to uh, determine whether or not surgery is necessary. Uh, there's no reason that Medi-Cal patients shouldn't have access to that as paid for by every other health system. And again, I would repeat that it's only done at the referral by a physician. It applies to very few. The department put trailer bill language in before designed to restrict this procedure to only those that have specific expertise for, for, poor, for performing this. Unfortunately, they limited it only to physicians, forgetting about the few physical therapists that also do this at the referral of a physician. So we'd like to see this corrected. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair Mitchell. Um, I'm Christina Romero from Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California, here to speak on item number 13, community clinic reimbursement for drugs and supplies. Um, we respectfully request that you include this item in the budget uh, to streamline the reimbursement scheme for Medi-Cal drugs and supplies. Um, last year, Assembly Subcommittee 1 um, adopted this proposal. It was a $5.9 million augmentation, but it wasn't included in 
in the final conference committee budget proposal. Um, since then, we've held discussions with DHCS, but nothing's um, come out of those discussions, unfortunately. Um, we still strongly believe that this approach is both fair and sensible with benefits to the state community clinics and the patients we serve. Specifically, the request would revise the Medi-Cal Family Pact reimbursement formula for drugs and supplies dispensed by requiring the clinic dispensing fee to be the difference between the actual acquisition cost of a drug or supply and the Medi-Cal reimbursement rate. Uh, clinics that dispense medication on site provide the added benefit of a one-stop shop that allows patients to leave our centers um, with medication in hand. That's extremely significant to them. Um, the convenience has led to improved access to health care and a better uh, patient health outcome. Um, uh, however, the clinic billing system, um, uh, clinics in the current system, clinics must use this overly complex system that leads to billing errors and requires staff time on both our side and the state side. So these errors take months to resolve and deny the clinic's um, reimbursement, which they're entitled. And we respectfully request your support. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members, Gregory Kramer, also um, from PPAC. Um, in addition to item 13 that Christina mentioned that we're in strong support of, I just wanna briefly mention the other uh, items that we do support, items number one, number three, Items nine and 10 uh, regarding AB 97, the 10% Medi-Cal um, uh, cut. It's a perennial issue and we hope it gets resolved this year. In addition, uh, item number 14, 15, 21, 22, and 36. And uh, specifically on item number 36, uh, we have to make sure that there is an incentive for doctors to uh, provide uh, healthcare in rural communities. It's become an issue for uh, primary care clinics, including Planned Parenthood, to find um, qualified individuals to provide these services, especially in rural areas. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Joe Michael for Equality California here, in particular in support of item number 14 on collection of data on race, ethnicity, language, and sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, as people previously mentioned, this data is tremendously important. Um, and just to highlight quickly uh, the need for the data on the LGBT community specifically, uh, this would be the first time this kind of data is collected on this level and there are multiple efforts to get additional data collected on sexual orientation and gender identity across California. And this data is critical for the health and well being of the LGBT community. Um, and also wanted to state our support briefly for Health for All um, in line with all of the reasons previously stated. Thank you. Leah Barrows on behalf of Children's Specialty Co Coalition for item 17, Pediatric In-Home Care Expansion Act. Also here on behalf of the March of Dimes and we are in support of item number 21, the Adolescent Family Life Program to expand, and, or excuse me, to restore it to the $6 million in funding. Babies are born um, to teen mothers when there are, excuse me, babies born to teen, teen mothers are more likely to be born preterm and with low birth weight. The goals of this program include improving healthy birth outcomes, and AFLP has demonstrated success at improving parent and child health. So we support. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, Chris Frank with Maxim Healthcare Services here in support of item 17. These uh, three pilot areas outlined in the bill, we think actually saves the state money because these kids are already getting these services, most of these kids are already getting these services today. They're getting them in a hospital setting and the hospitals have not been able to transition these kids to in-home nursing care. And the reason for that is a lack of nursing care. Last six months of 2015, Max and my company refused 75 discharges, so 75 opportunities to take a child from a hospital, put them in the home setting. Last year, we had to refuse solely due to not having enough nursing support. So we think that if we can transition these kids quicker, we know we can save the state money. Thank you for your support. The proposal is about is approximately what percent increase on the current? It would be a 20% increase in those three pilot areas. Great. Thank you. Next witness.
Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Senator Stone. Uh, Paul Bauer with Mercury on behalf of the Premier Healthcare Services, also on uh, item 17. Um, uh, I would also just, um, it, just to fi finish Chris's answer to your question, um, Senator Mitchell, this uh, program hasn't seen an increase in any funding of any kind in over 16 years. So it's been a long time and, and uh, we know that the cost savings well, we trust that the cost savings will realize if, if this item is adopted. So thank you for your time and attention. Appreciate it. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, uh, Kevin Pedrotti representing the California Birth Centers. Uh, we're in support of item nine and item 10. Uh, briefly, there are three birth centers in the state that take Medi-Cal patients. Uh, the cuts that they've uh, occurred uh, equals about $171 per patient. Uh, just to put it into context, uh, birth center birth is a less, little less than $2,000, while a hospital birth is probably closer to $16,000. So we would uh, recommend that the committee adopt these changes. Thank you. Nicole Whirlman on behalf of the Ventura County Board of Supervisors and Ventura County Healthcare Agency. Uh, we support both the Song Brown funding as well as the AFLP funding. Uh, in Ventura County, the loss of general funds in 9-10 fiscal year resulted in serving far fewer high-risk, low-income teens in hot spots around the county as well as in not being able to serve the entire East County. There are over 80 teens on the waiting list for much needed support and case management. Teen births and poor birth outcomes result in high costs to the state and to society. A restoration of the $6 million will help the state to leverage additional, additional matching federal funding and will help change the trajectory of this vulnerable population's future and impact successful outcomes of teen parents. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Jasmine Ortiz with Ultimate Health Services. Um, we strongly support the restoration of fund for Adolescent Family Life Program, item number 21. In 2015 alone, Ultimate provided services to 900 Los Angeles parenting teens and their family. Uh, this program allows parenting teens to graduate from high school and continue on to their educational goals. Additionally, this helps reduce repeated teenage births and pregnancies and has increased child immunizations for children born to teenage mothers. Restoring these funds will ensure that California continues to focus on prevention and the improvement of health and social economic outcomes by providing a sound investment for our current and future generations. We strongly urge you to restore the fundings for the AFLP program. Thank you. Michelle Stowell Parvensky, Children's Defense Fund, California. On behalf of CDF, as well as some of our children's health partners, the Children's Partnership, Children Now, and United Ways of California, uh, we'd like to support first um, item number three, the expansion of Medi-Cal to cover adults regardless of immigration status. Uh, we are obviously thrilled with the legislature's leadership in expanding coverage to all low-income uh, children regardless of immigration status starting on Monday. Um, but we know that children are going to be healthier, more likely to be covered and more likely to get regular care when their parents are also covered. Um, so we support the continued health for all movement. Our coalition also supports the proposals to improve children's dental um, services, particularly number 19, uh, the Children's Dental Disease Prevention Program, and item number 20, the Virtual Dental Homes uh, proposal, both of which are innovative models to improve access to dental care for children. Uh, an audit in 2014 found that less than half of children in, in the Dentical program were receiving their annual uh, preventive visit and we need to figure out a solution to make sure children are getting access to dental services. Um, so these, these innovative programs are, are an important first step as well as larger investments in improving um, reimbursement rates in the Dentical program. Um, and really appreciate uh, as well Senator Stone's comments about why it's so important to address children's uh, dental needs um, so that they can do well in school. Um, finally, on behalf of Children's Defense Fund, uh, we'd like to support a few items that address some of the health disparities affecting children of color, um, particularly supporting number 30, item number 31, the Strong California proposal to improve health outcomes um, for boys and men of color, um, and also um, item number 15, Medi-Cal interpreters. Thank you very much. 
Good afternoon, senators and staff. I'm Susan DeMorris with the Alzheimer's Association here to talk about item 26. Thank you for the opportunity to present on this on behalf of uh, the Alzheimer's Association, other stakeholders, and the 10 California Alzheimer's Disease Centers located at UC San Diego, UC Irvine, UCLA, USC, UC San Francisco, Stanford, and UC Davis. This is a one-time $2.5 million request to support a, collabor a collaborative project among all 10 centers. These centers were established in state statute in 1984. They've had um, funding cuts along with other programs um, since 2008, representing about um, a $30 million cut to the programs. Each one is a national leader at the forefront of Alzheimer's disease, and collectively they have specialized expertise in early detection and accurate diagnosis that we can benefit from statewide. This budget request focuses on three areas, cost, quality, and connection. Um, in terms of cost, this year California's Medi-Cal program will spend $3.3 billion on beneficiaries with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. As this population explodes over the next decade, these numbers will swell beyond 58% to well over $5 billion by 2025. To the second point, quality. As many as half of all Californians with Alzheimer's disease have not been diagnosed. And only 45% of people with Alzheimer's disease have been told of their diagnosis by their physician. This is unacceptable for the patient, for the payer, and the provider. In an era where quality is measured, where we rely on data and performance measures, we lack critical information to treat the disease, to coordinate care, and to refer to essential community-based resources. It's a cliche, but we can't improve what we can't measure. Underdiagnosis and underreporting of Alzheimer's disease impede our ab ability to provide quality care. Third and final point is connection. This week, the 10 Alzheimer's disease centers met for their annual planning session. The center director and neurologist described three pathways to their centers. Primary care physicians tell patients, one, it's just old age, don't worry about it, or two, there's nothing I can do, so why bother with a workup, or three, I don't have time to figure out what's going on, so I'm just gonna prescribe you Aricept or one of the other dementia medications in case it helps. Consequently, patients spend years looking for answers and they lose critical time to make important healthcare decisions, plan for their legal and financial needs, and take, effect, take advantage of effective low-cost interventions. Many are available free and in the community, such as support groups and caregiver training offered by the Alzheimer's Association. We urge your support of this one-time $2.5 million budget request to lower costs, improve quality, and create connections to care. Thank you for your consideration. Good afternoon, Senators. My name is Lynette Bloomhart, and I am a volunteer with the Alzheimer's Association, and I'm speaking to item number 26. I'm also speaking on behalf of every single person in California who is touched by the Alzheimer's disease. That includes patients, families, friends, caregivers, we're out there and we need some help. Um, my dad, who passed away last November, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2012. However, he showed signs of, of it long before that. Um, he suffered with the disease maybe up to 10 years before he was finally diagnosed. Um, he would say that something was wrong with him, that his brain just wasn't working correctly. And, um, but we chalked up his confusion, dad's confusion, to um, just the, the stages of, of getting older um, until it became so obvious that there was something wrong with him that we insisted on a, on a diagnosis and he was, we were told that he did have Alzheimer's disease. And I'm afraid that he missed out on some medications that may have helped him um, in the early stages of Alzheimer's and also some care and support that our family could have received had we known exactly what he had. Um, once he was diagnosed, he did receive some medications, but they were for, for later stages. And our family did receive resources and care and understanding of how to help him and transition him through the rest of his life. On behalf of all of us who are touched by Alzheimer's and, and the wave of those coming behind us, I sincerely hope that you support item number 26. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, my name is Katie Andrew, um, Children Now. On behalf of Children Now and the Children's Partnership, I'd like to echo Senator Stone's comments earlier about the low reimbursement rates for Denical. Um, we believe that by increasing the rates, we would be able, the program would be able to retain uh, high quality and culturally competent dental care providers. Um, secondly, I would like to speak to item 19. So on behalf of the approximately 70 groups and individuals who signed on to a letter, um, Children Now coordinated earlier this year, we support the restoration of the California Children's Dental Disease Prevention Program, or CCDDPP. Um, we believe the program would do several things to promote the oral health of California's most vulnerable children, including um, meeting children where they are in schools in order to provide screening, preventative services, and oral health education. Um, additionally, we believe that the program could also support the implementation of the state oral health plan um, by putting in place uh, the necessary infrastructure within counties through the local um, oral health advisory boards that are required by the program. Um, and then finally, we believe that uh, CCDDPP could also provide um, support and help strengthen uh, the kindergarten oral health assessments through, 14, or through AB 1433, which we know now are not being um, implemented consistently across the state. So thank you.